salvation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we've got a, it doesn't look like a heavy agenda, but it is a heavy agenda, and we are simultaneously coordinating with the Board of Finance that's meeting down the hall. The Board of Ed Administration folks are going to have to go back down there, and then the Board of Finance folks are going to be coming back here, so we're going to try and keep this meeting moving along. First item on the agenda is a discussion decision re regarding a supplemental appropriation request in the amount of $470,000, $470,000. $1,834 for uh, xenon plant sewage and repair, septic repairs and remediation. Uh, bring whoever you want up. So as everybody uh, knows, we had uh, an incident, <laughs> I guess we'll call it. Um, at the middle school, we had a, at one point in time, uh, uh, extensive uh, Sort of, sort of sewage overflow. Uh, we caught it almost immediately. I think we got it notified by a citizen and we related. It was really quick action. We, we contained the area um, and then the investigation began. And we'd like to sort of get us up to speed about the steps. You did a great job in the uh, record. Of, and anybody who's really interested in, in how this has happened, how it's unfolded, is a very thorough record of, of by, by minute almost, um, of the response. So. And it was presented at a meeting. Correct. Yeah, let me say a few things and then, then Rich can fill in and then representing the board, Ellen's here. Uh, Jean had a family obligation and family does come first, so it's really important she's she is and she sends her regrets. Um, my view on this whole thing is to move forward. Um, I, I think we, thanks to a good citizen in Weston, we caught this. Um, I actually got a district, but I quickly had a call, but the team got on, I think, within literally minutes, which is quite fortunate. Um, and it was contained quickly. Rumors of sewage going into the building, towards the building, were truly rumors. Uh, it, it was serious, but it went away from the building. It went out into the, the, the driveway area where we contained it, got it fast. Fortunately, and I think this is the view members of the board and others have been dealing with all very intensively, we were fortunate they now are. Uh, our partner, if you will, on this, there's a firm that we contracted with and, and Richmond filled that in because they, 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 they've been excellent. Uh, they do everything by the book, they document exceedingly well as you've seen these materials uh, right down to the minute, but they cross all the T's, dot all the I's legally and technically and otherwise. Strong photo record of everything we did and looked at here. Um, also, really important on this, we had an emergency meeting, and of course, we were part of that. Chair of the Board of Finance was part of that. I received a letter from the Board of Ed by phone with the building committee. I uh, think I my phone was on. At that point, of having to do something, we had to move fast because we learned that we do not have room to house our students in other buildings. So, we had to, uh, for safety and security reasons, we actually had to shut the entire campus because we had to close off. Uh, Road and once we had one in the school road closed, it was not safe to, to bring people on campus. But fortunately, then over the weekend, they were able to get the work done, get it fixed. But I think a good moment uh, by the leadership here to say, we're not going to point fingers now as to what happened, let's get it resolved. Yes, you've got to go out of pocket for quite a big sum of money. Uh, but we'll at least brought all the leaders together and said, let's get this done. We have gone back intensively to review what happened, to analyze it, to understand it. On my side of the ledger, but there has been accountability handed out. I, I'm not going to go any further than that. Uh, but we, we are looking at doing things very differently within within the district as it relates to maintenance, oversight, and management. Uh, and I, for, for personnel matters, I don't want to go any further than that. But I do want to make that very, very clear. Uh, Rich, if you want to kind of outline what's here financially, what where we are, and then open up the discussion to you, if we may. Um, so as was mentioned on February 19th, we did have that sewage uh, overflow. Uh, staff was called in, uh, DPW actually came and helped out, the police came to help out in Fort North Road. Road. Um, John Conte uh, was a real huge help to the Board of Ed during this entire process. Um, he actually helped with a number of issues. Um, so the sewage did come out. It appears that uh, the sewer line to the front of the middle school to the Xenon plant, um, even though there was all the architectural drawings, it simply never existed. Uh, from what the Viola could tell is that tank was working for a long period of time. So it was processing the sewage, which is why nothing ever happened you know, 10 years ago. Um, at some point that tank just simply failed and it basically became a holding tank for sewage. 
uh, until they could not hold anymore. Um, so it was about 6,000 gallon sludge in that tank um, when they ended up digging it out. Uh, so the supplemental before you is really three parts. Um, it is the emergency work uh, to clean up the spill. Actually, four parts, I'm sorry. Uh, emergency cleanup, which is about $13,000, which is to clean up the sewage, treat it, uh, haul it away properly. Uh, the emergency repair to connect the front of the middle school to the Xenon plant, uh, that's the largest amount. That was $352,000. There wasn't another abandoned tank um, to the left of the middle school. Um, that was filled essentially with the groundwater. It was not removed when the uh, construction happened in 2004. Uh, when they did actually take that tank out over spring break, it was in quite disrepair. Um, they had said the side of the tank was so bare that if you broke over, it would have to put it in that part of the tank. Um, so that tank was removed. Uh, John Toddy actually flagged a sewer line that was connected to the Xeno plant, connected to the, to the school, um, and was not pitched really properly. Um, it was causing a lot of uh, flow issues, which caused a lot of uh, daily pumping issues that we needed. Um, so working with John Cotty, he made recommendations on how to that uh, repair, which was also done for the next break week. Um, we also had an issue with Pearl Bug with the aging fields. Uh, there was concern of uh, oversaturation of the aging fields, so we had actually cordoned off that area with a construction fence. Um, there was possibility of concern of it actually being a failed leaching field, which would have been much worse. Um, John Cotty was fantastic in terms of coming over and kind of exploring and making recommendations. Um, he had a strong suspicion it was going to be a crushed pipe or a separated pipe. Um, so he made a number of recommendations. Datton Brothers actually came out and they did find a separated pipe underground. Um, so the septic field was working, the septic tank was working, but you had this separated, separated. pipe. Yeah. And so that caused the, um, that oversaturation of water. So the good news, <laughs> to be optimistic, <laughs> is that this process caused us to identify a bunch of liabilities that were sort of all over the campus. And I see this some recommendations for stuff to do in the future. So, you know, again, this stuff happens underground and anybody who's got a septic system, when it goes, it goes. Now, there was some history behind it. Uh, we, we have done extensive research on our part too. We're still trying to reach out to some of the original vendors. Some of them aren't around, some of them aren't talking, so we don't have a perfectly clear picture. We have somewhat of an idea, but my impression is we're never gonna get to the crux of exactly who signed off on what and how it happened because some of the people aren't even around anymore. That said, we do have a good understanding of what's under the ground now. We found all the different construction drawings, at least where stuff should have been. I, I know you looked at the existing pipes. It looked like nothing was leading out of that pipe, of, but you know, John Conti went back and looked at it. Um, again, the key issue is that it is fixed. It was fixed quickly. We lost a couple of days of school. I think, again, I try to never get personal, but <laughs> my ninth grader ends on a Friday and my seventh grader has to go back Monday, so I think the uh, middle schoolers are gonna be the angriest about this. <laughs> they get an extra day of school. But, and, and obviously a tax pay. I don't wanna- <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna minimize the money. This is a big deal. Um, but it, it did fix some other problems as, long, uh, as well as this. And the one thing I would ask, and I'm not sure if we can do, to ask um, Viola, what this would have cost if it wasn't a rush job. Um, because, you know, we should understand what, what, what this would have cost to fix versus what it cost to fix because we expedited. No, we had to expedite it. There was a lot of exigencies and we had to get school going. And, and every day that school shut down, I forgot what the figure was, but you gave us some kind of couple hundred thousand dollars. Couple hundred thousand dollars. So it, 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 there's no way it made sense not to, to sort of rush this, but it's just something I think we should ask in the record so that we know you know, what, what the real price, because people are gonna say, hey, I looked at this and this would never cost that, and we just have to, just for the record, have that. So I, that would be a request I'd make, and that's, you know, the only thing I would put on this. And otherwise, I just, you know, from my perspective, the work's done, it's, you know, this is basically paying. Chris, when you were saying we're going back to, to uh, vendors and things like that, you mean, are we going back to talk about, uh, talk to the people who might be responsible for, Screwing this up in the first place? I mean, is there well, the statute of limitations is over, so that it would be forensic just for curiosity's sake, which is why we're not like going forward. We cannot recover and get anything back. This, if, if something happened, it happened, I think, back in 2000, probably 2004. 2004. So this, it usually gets six years on this stuff. It would be just, and again, 
as with all construction processes, the relationships don't always end pretty. So my understanding is some of them might not even want to talk to us. So I, Tracy did a whole lot of work on this. The members of the building committee were looking at it. We have some picture of it. We understand what went on. But again, when you're looking at construction documents and change orders and stuff, and there were change orders and everything. Um, and who, did we pay for, for, for what was allegedly put in there and then it wasn't? It, it's not altogether clear. We have some record. So we are looking at that. We're going to pursue that. But we, I think we should have, you know, clarity to the extent we can. And we have a lot of that documented for the record. But we're not going to be able to change anything. We're not going to be able to call back anyone. So was, is it clear that it was a mistake? That this pipe went to nowhere? Or was this... It's not even clear it went to nowhere. So there's, different, <laughs> there's a couple of different theories of what happened. One was... It, it, it comes out of school, it goes under the stairs, it goes to this embankment, and there's a tank there. Then there are pipes that come out of the tank that go to the xenon plant where leaching field used to be. Now there's a xenon plant and the pipes were going there, but nothing was really flowing to the beginning. It was operating. It was a <laughs> we checked it, a lot of the ground and stuff. Um, there are theories that there was a bypass that went kind of up and around the school and then came back down and came to the school. So far, they couldn't find, at least when they were excavating in there, they didn't find any record of that thing in there. But that was kind of what was in, originally in the design. So it's, uh, we could, if you want to get into it, there's a lot to get into, and it might be interesting. Yeah, and but the OLA, I mean, they sent people into the tank. They sent cameras into the tank. Uh, smoke tests. They did all, yeah. Yeah, so it was a very thorough look. Not, again, not the place to find the trying to stand, mm -hmm. you know, to, and then catch and correct other things, such as then we discovered this tank on the Revson side middle school and we had to get that dealt with and this the the, the, the inverter pipe we also had to deal with that. and it's this happened when they were doing the whole school campus so there's like and they were trying to hit it on deadline and they did hit it on deadline but there's a ton of different projects going on simultaneously and it's for, forensically going back and figuring it out is, is somewhat complicated so I mean I'm sure that Tracy would be happy to sit down with you and go through sort of the record if you're curious one of the other things is we're not, <laughs> even if something was done back in 2004-ish, we're not exactly certain what happened in the years immediately following that. Was there a pipe disruption? If it, was, if it was a pipe put in that led to a leaching field from this tank, was there something done in another project that, that disrupted that pipe? We're not sure. So. But fun. But More yeah. than I ever wanted to know about xenon plants and so but my feeling is we have enough information to make sure something like this never happens again. Well, right? ne never is a big never. word. <laughs> never. But, uh, I can assure you. <laughs> like, um, I, I don't want to go in yes, back and relitigate, yeah, no, yeah, you know, well, but would, it's about, yeah, I want to have enough if information. If I were sitting in your shoes, I'd ask the same questions. Yeah. So I might take the never out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm an optimist. But, but no, but let me, let me, let me be really serious. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, from the things we can control and manage, we've said we, we have to get as close to never as possible. Okay. We have to change our protocol, we have to change our system. So indeed, Rich is presenting to the finance committee, excuse me, facility committee of the board and the board, a very detailed maintenance schedule for everything we have on campus. We're now searching for a new director of facilities. Often when a new director comes in, and well, so you can spend the money, careful, <laughs> that you go through and tag everything. So we have manhole covers. Go look, what's under that? That's what that's, I that's, that's, that's So that, my that will question. be part of the new process. Okay. Um, and. Uh, and in, so that that's again I don't want to say never but we will do things differently from the parts that we oversee and control and the, the, and the board's okay. insisting on that I think from the very first time I talked to the excuse me, first selectman after this I talked to the chair of the board of finance after this I said we, we got to get through this get it fixed we know it's expensive uh, but we're out of school, it's a safety issue, it's a health issue, but then we need to figure out from the district side what do we do differently going forward. And there are things we can do differently, we're documenting that and we'll do different. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. Anything else? Again, the manhole covers, I'm glad. Alan? I will, again, I want to try and move this meeting along, so. Well, I've been listening to you, and I think everything sounds very sort of reasonable. It's just a little piece of information that we have that you haven't talked about. And that they want to know, it doesn't point fingers or anything like that, it just fills in a missing gap. Uh, there, there was a um, request for $85,000 appropriation when those leaching fields were taken out and placed in the Louisiana plant. 
to connect directly with that bank where it is. Yes. $85,000 is not approved, but $15,000 above. Right. Which would then bypass that connection from the uh, SEPTIC and go up to the another existing connection up on the existing pipe. And, and we didn't find any record of that connection. Yes. Well, we did. There's an existing, uh, they say, uh, asphalt support. Yeah, but not physical. There's the drawn show. That was the end of my second. Yeah. There's an asphalt story showing that there's actually a, uh, a, a uh, which I have with me tonight, a receipt for payment of fifteen thousand dollars, asphalt showing it was built, but when it was excavated, I was there. I didn't see it. Right, but there was a sign off from the people at the time Everybody's for the change off. order, and there was a, an the the eighty-five thousand for the record didn't go through my understanding is because they were trying to keep the budget down. Yes. We don't, again, I don't want to go through the whole history, but thank you for adding that to the record. But for those of you who are interested in the whole thing, there's a whole lot more detail, um, exhaustive, um, and you could talk for hours and hours on it, and you can look at the diagrams and all sorts. It's fun <laughs> if you're into that. Um, that said, we do hit a dead end because of those issues. There's stuff that's drawn that might not be in the ground, and at that point, you know, you're like, there's a lot of different fingers to point, and the people who are pointing them at are long gone and beyond the statute of limitations. Some of them, and some of them internally, are like just different interpretations going on. So it's there. We're, you know, that's the record. So, motion. Uh, I'll do it. Are you? I move to. Move to authorize a fiscal year 2018-19 supplemental appropriation to the Board of Education budget in the amount of $470,834 for xenon plant sewage and septic repairs and remediation. And second. And again, this is for stuff that's all done. Right. None of this is forward looking, so. No, all right. Uh, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good, done. Good luck with the Board of uh, Finance. Okay, next item. Uh, discussion, decision regarding a request for supplemental appropriation in the amount of $21,500 uh, from the Friends of Lashot for driveway and drainage improvements. Fortunately for you guys, you had that pollinator pathways event during the, one of the rainiest days of the year, and I got to go there and see what we're talking about. <laughs> So anybody who's seen pictures or who has been to Woodstock at that time, uh, close, right? So basically, th their parking lot is a nice dirt field until it rains and then it immediately turns into a mud field. Did you crash out there? Uh, <laughs> it's about this far down. Um, my shoes were like, you know, it was making great slurping sounds. That said, um, so this is for, um, John, can you want to go through a little yeah, bit of history sure. very quickly about so we we've known for about a year at least that we've had issues with drainage and we've had issues with immediate entries into the facility, uh, both at the lower level, upper level, and with the driveway um, to the residents. We see the driveway deteriorating, um, and we get a lot of rain. We've seen how the conditions have worsened. We still have a lot, have a lot of rain that, you know this spring. And we have a host of activities coming up where the public will be invited and their cars will drive up. Um, so that, that's why this has been a project that's kind of been on the back burner and been moved really to where it is right now in front of you today. Um, we've, we've everything from wood chips to put down on there. Public Works has examined what they can do to fix it and it's really beyond their scope. So, Ellen um, and a town engineer um, sought three proposals from firm, area firms to provide fixes, do an apples to apples comparison with price. Ultimately, we got two back, and this was the, um, the best of all the proposals received. And they actually have already started working. The friends, to their credit, have already committed to, if, if the supplemental is not given, to taking this price entirely on, it's a big risk. Um, because they're, they've been able to raise money over the past few years doing these great activities. But they have said, look, this is really a fundamental town responsibility to take care of a piece of town property. And so that's why they're before you to ask for just half of the contribution. Um, and uh, I, I, 
we have also talked for months about whether or not the town could pay for all of this and then just wait over the course of the next several years for us to get disbursements from the fund that was created when this transaction was done, the sale, purchase and sale of the property. And it was determined that we're already in the red, about $12,000. Um, we're going you know, we're not going to be in the black until another year about and then once we're in the black we have several projects already in the queue with respect to roofing foundation work um, Siding repairs all things that really need to get done just to take care of this property and keep it in good shape So with that being said, I, you know, I wasn't comfortable saying all right Well, let's tack another, you know $50,000 amount in the red and wait like seven more years to get caught up on payments so that is why this is here before you come. And this is a compromise, and yeah, you know, you drafted, so there's a lease structure where they're kind of run the house and we manage the property. This is technically a part of property now. Given that, the way it's funded is generally there's this fund um, that we disperse a certain amount for, for work on it, but like Jonathan said, that's already in the red with the stuff they've already done. So the issue is, do we wait and let this continue to go for a couple of years? without doing anything. Um, and you have more and more people coming there and- I think it would affect attendance eventually, so I don't- I, But I just wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't just affect attendance, it affects well, you know, the experience. And, and, and revenue. <laughs> and revenue. Well. And revenue. Is it safe? Uh, well, I don't think it's dangerous, but okay. it's, not, it's not helping the land one single bit. Um, uh, they're grooves and ruts. Yeah, and exactly. We also need a, need a constant maintenance that we don't have to do to get it fixed. Well, it has to be done at some point anyway. You will not be able exactly. to hold events in the lower lot or the upper lot given, given Certainly not this time the, I don't think this time of year, time. given yeah. given rain and given the amount of people that are coming to all these events. So then, you know, there's a very extensive negotiation. I think it's a, a, a fair compromise where the friends generously agreed to put some of them because it's not the house. Mm -hmm. So they're going That's outside right. of sort of their comfort zone, putting up money. We'd be going outside of our comfort zone not using necessarily, you know, the, the usual mechanism we would, but I think there are exigencies again, because just having seen it, it, it makes it kind of not particularly functional. I, I'd like to mention another thing too. Um, the Friends have gotten grants in the past from uh, the Connecticut Historic Trust to do barn restoration, and you just got another one. The yeah, the 1776 uh, yeah. or is it two, 70, whatever. It's 1772. 1772 <laughs> Foundation. So that's another thing where you went out on your own. It's going to be a $10,000 grant. You're going to make that match really to do repair work to buildings that the town owns. It's not even the residents. So just wanted to put that out there too. That's really good. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, make a motion. I move to establish a new capital account number 5019667-55001 and entitled Rashad Town Farm Drainage and Driveway Improvements of the Fund Set Capital Account with a Supplemental Appropriation in the amount of $21,500. Could I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Again, thank you all for everything you do, all volunteers. Uh, it's a fantastic asset. I know, thank you very for the record, when's the first Friday? Uh, well, we still have the 31st for our fire side. That's concert. okay. What's the next? Event? And then the next, I think, is the 26th. If somebody has a phone, I think it's the 26th. Okay. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll certainly blast it around when it's coming up. So okay. thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you guys stick around? Yes, I'm here. And, 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 yeah, we'll go over to the next one. Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, discussion uh, with Eversource about its recently changed and approved wedding, wedding to Wil Wilton project. My understanding, come on up Tracy or whoever is coming up to, uh, for, the, for the fun. <laughs> Okay, so um, just to get up to speed, this has been a project that you guys have proposed a while ago. Um, it's going back and forth. You've come to us now, this is the third time? Yeah, this is the third time. Yeah. But at this point, 
that would the court sort of tell us what to do because technically you answer the pure, right? The citing council. Yep, the citing council is where we uh, filed our petition. Right, and they have at this point approved yes. the most recent plan. Yes. Um, and it's substantially similar to what you've been presenting, right? It's the exact same project that we've been presenting, that we presented back in November and December. But and then with a lot the, more specifics specifically in there now. Well, the only thing that's, that, that changed is that the mapping is public. Previously, I know you guys were asking for that. It wasn't public because it hadn't been filed. Otherwise, the information, all of the structure heights that we've talked about previously, all of that is exactly the same. Okay, and, and the other thing is the means of egress and, and ingress have changed. You decided We've added one um, you're coming alternative location. Through the Wilton transfer station, right? Was that so that was actually a part of our original petition. Was but you're also going to come up through a uh, DOT property lane? Right? Was, was the D your DOT access in the No, so that's the only change from our original like, you know, okay. for access points. Um, we've added the um, C dot property off of Georgetown Road as an alternative access that we're currently evaluating. Is that an evaluating or is that the property? I thought the DOT gave you approval to use that property. No, so they've given us approval to survey the property and we're currently talking with them about using that property, um, but we haven't signed any agreements or anything like that yet. Okay. So Who's your contact at the DOT for that? I get, we can get back to you. All right, please do. Yeah, I appreciate that. We do have some questions. We have some questions tonight. from the public that got filtered up through us, so we're going to ask you in their stead. Um, Again, I, yeah. before we do that, uh, could you characterize your interaction with, with, with property owners up to this point? Yeah, sure. Actually, at first, I'd also like to introduce Roxanne Hoff is our new project manager right. as we're moving on to the next phase. Uh, so I know it's a new phase. I just wanted to make sure that, um, that that. So our interaction with the property owners so far, I mean, this project began back in 2017. So when we originally filed our petition with the Connecticut Siting Council. So our interactions really started back then with sure. property owners. I'm explaining the scope of the project. Um, we got approved in March of 2017 from the Siting Council, um, and that's when we realized that there were that we needed to replace the structure, that we did some internal analysis. So I'd say our outreach kind of paused for a little bit as we did further analysis. And once we got all the new information that we needed to, and we were preparing to make an amendment filing on the Siting Council, we reinitiated outreach. Um, you know, for us, we send letters to residents, we do postcards. Um, we have on-site meetings, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings. Have we looked off at all of them now? Um, I think we've, I think we've door knocked, and, and I don't know if we've had on-site meetings with every single resident, but we've left notices, we've mailed notices to every single resident. Um, so we'll, we'll probably get into some of those details too, um, and some feedback. So the first question is, uh, can you indicate a timeline when work will start and be completed for each whole structure of Upper Parish Drive, i.e. top or bottom of the street, can you provide a height for each numbered structure? And I think that's in there now, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's a structure okay. table, yeah. I don't want to answer for you, but. Yeah, <laughs> um, um, can you provide what type of restoration upgrade after the job is, com uh, after the job is completed, i.e. bushes, trees, road, um, you know, your, what your expected restoration will be, but that probably will also be contingent on all kinds of service you, you have, right? But you got estimates on those? for each of the sites at this point? So it, it depends on each structure and it depends on the property owner that that structure lands on. So we work individually with every property owner uh, based on the impacts that their property so When are you going to be able to provide that to the specific property owners? Because you now know the heights, you know the locations. Yeah, so it really, I mean, it depends. Um, sometimes we delay making formalized commitments on restorations until construction starts because really, for us, we want people to see the impacts before we you know what I mean? So construction, sometimes we can explain it the best we can, but until people see it, it's hard for them to, to visualize. So sometimes we want to do more after construction than... Exactly, yeah. So that, that's really what our, our goal always is. We work with property owners, and it absolutely depends on... You know, so, I mean, again, these, these things are all the same thing. So, I mean, when, when do you anticipate this whole thing starting? Yeah, so our schedule currently right now is to start vegetation um, trimming and removal in select areas in June. Now, trimming and removal, that's physical because yes. there's been some concerns about chemical work that's been done up there. And then when last time we talked to you about that, you said, well, the vegetation management crew that has nothing to do with this re replacement project would be the ones who are potentially using it, but you would reach out to them or have some feedback and that 
anything that was done near any wetland, you were, and I, you did go to the conservation, right? We did go to conservation commission, so again, there's, there's no herbicide use as part of this project, so. But is there so herbicide start, use on the poles? So when we start in June, and then when we end our project, and we do restoration in the spring of 2020, there's no herbicide use. Is on the there maintenance, way. herbicide based maintenance used Ever on the poles? Everest does use herbicides for maintenance, but that's a separate department, and that's not something I can speak to here. Um, I know that our um, vegetation management folks, I think they did send a letter to the town um, yeah. about herbicide use, so they're absolutely willing to come and talk to the town about that. It's just separate from our project. Could, could, you, could we arrange a meeting with the selectmen, with those folks, to come and, and, come and talk about that? Two weeks from tonight. You're loading okay. up that schedule already. I am. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean, again, that's, that was a concern that we've had since then. And I know that they're separate projects, but while we have you in here and interested in us, we think you're going to be a lot more attentive to those issues than once you're no longer interested for this, and then we're like calling up and saying, okay, the vegetation grew, and they're like, okay, well, whatever. So now, you know, if, if we can get, uh, arrange something, that would be fantastic, because that, that is probably one of the largest concerns with, with what Eversource does on these projects. And it's a large concern. It's not just Eversource, it's also the DOT and the side of our roads and glyphosates and all that. I mean, it's a big deal. We no, just want to keep talking about it. Problem. And just be mindful, and I think we've spoken to them before. There are multiple vegetation management departments. There's one of the James Foley, too. I'm sure there are. The transmission, but we also have a vegetation management group that maintains for the distribution site. So. Whoever we need to talk to, whoever's going to be putting, spraying anything on the posts that are potentially near wetlands or not near the wetlands because we just had we, we i just declared that this is the year of the pollinator and exactly and and it would be kind of sad if the year of the pollinator were the year that we wiped out the bee population so um and, and that that is what does it and i mean there's a, there's a ton of we don't need to go through that you know there's a ton of research you know there's a lot of it i'll say also i have talked to the the head of the uh, Department of Public Health, and they don't agree with sort of the use of some of this stuff. So even internally in the state government, it, it, there's not a consensus of what's safe or not. And we would just like to officially take a position that we would like to lean towards uh, being as conservative as possible with anything that's put on our property, given the amount of wetlands, and we've expressed that, and you've agreed, and you have come to, to, to conservation, and I appreciate that. Um, can you, same thing, can you provide what type of vehicles will be entering an upper parish drive and the weight of each vehicle given the condition of our existing road? So are we going to be using upper parish drive? Because so we, haven't, we haven't settled on that yet. No, we haven't. So we're currently evaluating, as you said, the access through the CDOT property. Right. Um, so we're currently weighing our options. We want to make sure- So there may be nothing going on. There could be, yeah, there could be nothing. Okay. Um, so really, yeah, it depends. We want to make sure that what we're doing is the least impactful to the community, to the environment. Uh, and you know, there's obviously costs associated with that. So for us, lowering the cost is always important. So we want to make sure that we're balancing all of those things. Um, so we're working towards a decision. Understood. But so, so Chase, that's that's an important change yeah. that's happened since the original meeting. Is, is that it was originally slated to go up Upper Parish Drive, and you're negotiating with the town and with all the neighbors for for access rights as opposed to using the easement, and that hasn't been settled. And yeah, I mean, you might not even use that. So I assume. If you find out that operationally and financially it makes sense to do it, we'll begin talking about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yep. And, and no work would start happening at all in that area until we finalize our actions. Sure. So we, we can't. Okay. Um, this is, I guess, for us, I guess, will the town of Weston make sure Eversource will comply with the restoration of our road, open space, and if not, Will the town hold them accountable? Well, that's what we're trying to do now. So we're getting you on record with commitments. Um, you know, what, what's the oversight like from the siting council to ensure? Do they do site visits? Um, the siting council doesn't do site visits, at least to my knowledge. Um, they, they typically don't do site visits. I mean, we at Eversource um, compliance is a key factor, and we have a whole compliance. Correct. We have a, a big compliance initiative, so we have a big regulatory compliance matrix that we pass out to all of our crews. We go over our construction meetings to make sure they know what our commitments are, what our obligations are, and follow them. But so compliance yeah, from your end is different than sort of municipal level compliance because you guys. An environmental inspector that it goes out into the field and does reporting for us, but it's 
do they interface with anybody to town when they come, or they just go on their own? We don't have our land use. They director. go on, and they, they actually report up through um, for our environmental permits and through our construction. It, would it be possible that when they those people come, we're notified, and we could send somebody just to tag along? Or is it? Um, it definitely would depend um, private property wise, where we're, we're the, you know, sure. we can't give everyone rights to access someone else's property just because we have easement. Right. So you have the easement. We don't. We can see if. Um, Okay, just again, the more oversight, the more yeah. comfortable people are going to be. I mean, there's a lot of skepticism. You said, we're the new Eversource, and I'm going to take you up your word. But the old Eversource would come in, they'd basically do what they wanted, they'd track, they'd deforest and foliate with whatever they wanted, and then they'd say, okay, thank you, and kind of mosey along, and there would be no recourse. So we're trying to do a lot of this up front, and you know, you've come down here and been cooperative on that. Um, I wish there were a little more transparency in terms of, I know you're saying that the project wasn't public so you couldn't share it, um, but I'm not sure why you couldn't share the whole heights on any of your properties. I know you oh, shared, we did walk through that. The first meeting we went through, right. we talked through the But not the individual. Keep, keep asking which heights could be which properties, and you've talked to the individual land yeah. property owners about that, right? Yeah, and so I can tell you right now, the only three structures are uh, increasing in height more than 10 feet, and those three structures are in the so top of three of them are increasing. By, by more than 10 feet. Right. Yep. The other five structures are between three and seven feet increase. Well, so what's the negative. difference? Well, I mean, the, I mean, if you keep it back, I think they're the one that's Yeah. Sure. Um, just, again, you know, I'm glad that, so now we're going to, this is going to be public record, so the yeah. actual heights are available for anybody. Should we put, can we put this up on our town site? Absolutely. So, yeah, our petition amendment, we did mail letters to all um, abutting property owners. Um, regarding our petition amendment filing, all of the documents are available on the Connecticut Site Council website. If anyone else wants us to email those files, then we're happy to do that as well. And but now we're allowed to put them on our site too. Absolutely, yeah. Yep, okay. the, the, we want to email them to you guys. You okay, guys are perfect. Um, um, where, where are the workers parking and where the be for the potty place? To where, they, we don't know where they're coming in. So that, that you'll provide to everybody. Do you mean specific that for parish? Well, yeah, yeah upper parish, we don't, you don't even know if you're using them, right? Yeah. No, no. So, so if it's going to be at the DOT, it's going to be at the DOT. But are, do they expect to put those anywhere else? No. We will have a show-up site for all of our contractors. Where would we, we know where that will be? We're determining that right now. That's part of our onboarding our construction contractor. So okay, they will so work that's the one that's there. We can do that. Yeah, and that's our little park. Um, if there are any issues, will Eversource provide a contact person and direct them? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm on this project. I know we're going to see here with us. They've been on this project since day one. So, um, you know, we're the outreach representatives for this scope of work. We're happy to answer any more questions about that. We're available. And, and, and you're, just because I have to ask this, wouldn't longer term it be a better idea just to bury this stuff? You wouldn't have to worry about the elements and replacing and stuff. And I know it's expensive because we've talked, we, look, our town gets knocked out every every storm. <laughs> And I know it's like, what, what is it, a million dollars every half mile or something crazy? And I know these lines are probably even worse, and then you've got underground electrical transmission and affecting the, the underground vegetation. I just, does that, what, how does that calculation ever happen? We look at Only, a lot of different alternatives when we get a need for a project, so we always look at customer impact, financial aspects. Because they would love it if you did that. Sure, I mean, everyone, everyone would, right? But unfortunately, when we look through, we want to weigh all those things to get the balance, like Sam mentioned. So rebuilding everything underground is it's cost and, yeah. But I mean, long term maintenance doesn't ever catch up. No, I would say it's between over and underground lines, but maintenance, while underground lines are, they're, you don't see them, but if there's an issue with an underground line, it's hard to find. So it takes a lot longer to find an issue and fix it than the overhead lines, so they both have their focus. And if you're wetlands, it's not going to happen either. Yeah, exactly. So if, if we're yeah. concerned about anything with wetlands, if you, we don't, certainly don't want to trench them. I have, I, have an, I have another question. Uh, we were wondering if all the trees that you plan on cutting have been physically marked. The charts in your report seem to have different trees marked than what has been physically marked, and we want to know which, which is accurate. Also, if you plan on raising the lines between 10 and 27 feet, do these trees even need to be cut because that is, it is more than likely that they will not grow that tall. It was a little hard to surmise with the charts which poles were being raised and to which height. Um, and when will the cutting? 
So the trees that are marked out, not all of the trees that we are removing are, are marked out. We've been working with the individual property owners at some places, and that might be what we see for some of the flags out there. So not all of what's on the mapping is identified out in the field. And to answer the question of why we're removing them, Veg Management goes through to make sure that danger trees or anything that can potentially fall into the lines and put the reliability of that system at risk what is what comes out. So they're looking for anything that can be a potential future concern for the lines when we're out there as well. So. If a tree is marked, that tree is definitely going. There just might be more trees that are going. A tree that's marked to be cut down isn't marked in error. We haven't flagged anything for construction. Correct. Yet. Okay. So Correct. we will be flagging um, and staking it in the right of way. And, and it's but you're doing work with individual property owners for each of those. So if there's something on their property, yeah. and they know it. They yeah, before construction starts. And it's certainly, I mean, is there an appeal process? When, if it's within our easement, um, and if it's a danger tree or an issue for the lines, there isn't an appeal process. Do you have process. to work with our tree warden at all? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> I suspected that because it's just like Because we go through the siting council process. Right, the siting council basically bypasses all towns. Yeah, there's an exemption in the state. What, what, sure. Can it be said, are you comfortable saying that a tree will not be cut down prior to it being flagged? Um, well, we at least, we, we don't necessarily flag every individual tree. If that's a request of a property owner, we can certainly work with them on that. But generally, if there's larger areas where we need to do additional clearance to the edge of our right of way or something like that, we'll stay to the edge of the right of way instead of flagging every individual tree. Because sometimes there could be saplings and things like that. Yeah. It could be quite an extensive process if we had to do that. I'm just trying to think, you know, I hear not every tree that's flagged is cut, and not every tree that we cut gets flagged. So how did how do the Western residents know what's going to be cut? Yes, yeah, so we'll be starting our surveying for construction um, shortly, I think in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, and we'll, you know, we will work with property owners if they have questions about the staking, we'll notify them, we can talk to them about it, walk them through all the properties, exactly what's happening. All right, I met with them, and I think all of them want to know what trees are going to be cut. Yeah, so we can get a picture of yeah, so the trees. Yeah, we can reach the other stuff. They don't necessarily have better views of the truth than both permits. Will there be any replanting of trees? So we work with individual property owners on restoration of the property, and it's 100% based, based on impact. So before um, construction and after construction, what the difference is, then we do uh, restoration based on that. So yes, sometimes it involves plantings, other times it may not. There's some other questions. You want to look at them? No, no. Okay, so I mean, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole batch of questions about some previous arrangements with vegetation maintenance. I could start talking, but you're going to tell me that's a different division. If, it, if it's related to herbicides, yes. But that has to be addressed, I think. And, and once, if we get the, the, the management people will come down, I think we can take care of the, the management. Because there were some agreements with specific property owners that any time, you know, stuff was used near their properties, it would be taken care of, and it's not clear that that was all. Everything for this project is mechanical cutting. So it's hand cutting, right. mechanical cutting. So, so that's a separate thing. Yeah. Um, and again, you, you're not using it, so we don't have to talk about you coming back and talking about herbicides or pesticides. Yeah, that would be our vegetation That's all that. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get them in a couple of weeks. Um, Um, and there's a question about uh, compensation for declining values resulting from building hideous towers. <laughs> yeah. I know in some places that's happened. There's been uh, suits filed. New Hampshire, I think. We'll, uh, I, mean, I, I certainly can address it. So if someone feels that their property value has gone down as a result of our project, um, what we ask is that they submit actual calculations, assessments, showing the loss. Um, so we can't go based off of a letter from a real estate agent or something like that. It has to be an actual calculation of loss. Then it goes through an internal process at Everstore to do our claims group um, where we evaluate that claim. Um, What's an accepted type of report? Something done by a, a appraiser? A appraiser? Yeah. License appraiser. Okay. So there is a mechanism for that, so all neighbors know that. Um, 
Eversource high voltage power line buried under Route 7. How will this be used after new line 1470 construction is completed? Is there an access to those two things? No, they're two separate transmission lines, so they both will still be in use. They're both, uh, it's, so it's two different circuits. They're both constantly in use. It's part of the larger grid, so it's not like you turn one off and another one on. When you feel like it, they're all constantly working. Okay. And I mean, again, you're kind of updating this on, we don't have any say <laughs> I mean, we, we, we could complain and stuff, but really the siding council wants to say this is okay or not. Well, yes, yeah, so and certainly when we came here um, to present to you guys, if you had asked us to come uh, full time in the conservation commission before we filed, we wanted to make sure we were answering questions and, and working through this process before we filed the siding council. And they have given us our approval, so we are preparing to start construction. Uh, but uh, of course, it's always an ongoing conversation. If there's concerns, questions, we're happy to answer them. We're happy to work with property owners as we begin this process. Sam. I have a quick question. What, when did Eversource submit to the Siting Council the revised application? Yeah, so we submitted our petition amendment the 12th of April. So one thing that I find very frustrating is I got an email on the 12th of April from you saying, hey, just want to let you know we're submitting a revised application. And it's very frustrating because we come to the Board of Selectmen to provide them with details important details about the project and at that time Eversource is not comfortable sharing information about heights and location height changes exact location changes and that's like a key part of the project so that the Board of Selectmen can hear from their constituents and constituents can know that and that's not shared with us and then we get noticed the same day that the amendments been filed with the site council and I think it's very frustrating because we're trying to have open communication. And what I would have, I think the, the, you know, just sitting at the meeting, there was a desire from the selectmen to know about changes made, presumably before the application is submitted to the site council. They're volunteers, they meet twice a month. And so, you know, that's very frustrating and from my perspective because this is, you know, if, you know, people at home don't constantly search the Siting Council website to check when the update comes in, or the amend, that amended so application. Give us a heads up. And, and this is the venue, really, for them to do that. So that is very frustrating, I think, from my perspective, given the relationship we've tried to establish. And it puts us at a significant disadvantage to comment. You know, by the time I get that email on April 12th, and I go through the amendment, and I start communicating it to the selectmen, and I can only do so much because this is really where the business gets done. I get a letter from the siting council saying the amendment's approved, and that is, I think, you know, having met with the residents, that's something that they don't appreciate. You know, that I, I feel like really the best course of action would have been to come back to the selectmen and to, the, to have said, "Hey, you asked for specifics about the heights and location changes. We told you we couldn't do that, but now we have it." And to hear from them, and let them open it up and go back and forth with their constituents. So that, I mean, that, that's my expression yeah, of frustration have having, having met with the council. So if I can just make a couple of points. I mean, the, the last time that we did come to the board of I did talk through the structures and the heights. Yeah, but not um, the individual ones, which you actually have I, to submit to the I, I, I mean, We did. We walked through that. There's three structures that are taller than 10 feet, and then there was the three. The other thing right, but not, not where they were. Yeah. 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 Did, so, did the homeowners care where they were? I, I completely understand it. And to make we didn't ask for an expedited review of our petition in any way or our amendment. Um, we simply submit and then the siting council, uh, they, sometimes they can take 60 days, sometimes it can take 10 days. Um, we don't have a say in when they approve it. Um, so I, I completely understand that that was a surprise um, to you all and I, and I get that. Um, we certainly, um, you know, well, we were happy to see our petition approved. You know, that's not something that we're the government moves faster than you expect it from us. Yeah, but that has to be expected. Right. You submit enough of these applications that you know it could be as early as 10 days. Absolutely, and so that's why we had met with you guys three times previously to make sure that we were providing all the information that we could. I mean, the mapping, while it wasn't public information, we met with property owners. We, were sh we could show them the mapping before them. That's what we said at our first meeting, is that if any property owner wanted to see the mapping, we're happy to meet with them at their house. Did we anyone avail them themselves of that? I think we did meet with quite a few property owners okay, after good. that first meeting. So they're doing, yeah. we... I do also want to point out, too, we also, we, we try to 
wait to have the final design for when we submit these types of things so that what we commit to, to property owners it doesn't change. We don't want to tell them we're doing one thing and then we have to change for whatever reason something might come out. We want to make sure that what we're telling them is you know what we're doing out there. I understand, but I think it's also important for the Board of Selectmen to see the final design as a, just as a follow-up conversation when that is specifically what they wanted. The, that contained the information that was important to them. And, that, and, and instead it just went right to the siting council and before we could have another meeting, the siting council approved it. And, and we will take that back too because we, yeah. thought we, had let, we, had, we thought we had given that information. We thought we had provided that in the previous meetings that we presented at with the heights and the, the locations with the property owners that were discussed out in the field. So we will certainly take that back to make sure because our goal is to work with you guys. Yeah, again, if really we're going to be have these meetings and be transparent, let's be right. just a mutual trust on both sides. We're going to trust you that you're going to follow through right. and to clean up any other stuff. You've got to trust us that you know, you don't have to come and say, oh, this is approved, you guys can't do anything. Just trust that we're going to work with you. And yeah, that's, and cer that's certainly not the way that we wanted this meeting to proceed. We, we didn't want to come here and say, oh, we're working, we can't do anything. Obviously, we're here no, to have a conversation. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay, we want to have these ongoing conversations. Right. That's um, how, we, how we want to No. Okay. There's a motion there. That I just added a motion. That's whatever you want to do on this is, is your call. I'm not, you know. I just wanted to express my disappointment and you know not having that return meeting to the, with the board of selectmen to share that specific information. Um, it's already been approved by the siting council, so um, I think at this point we you know they'll, they'll come back in two weeks hopefully and we'll hear about the oversight maintenance. Not that you're going to do as part of this project, but continual maintenance. Yeah, but this has nothing to do there. This has nothing to do with the project. That's the problem. So perhaps uh, no motion and just an expectation that they'll come back in two weeks with information about the continued use of herbicides and the continued And then we'll make a decision on how comfortable we are either supporting or otherwise the project is because we've got to hear from the So because part of the project is separate from the project. So I just want to make sure that we're understood. I'm talking about con but we have to after this project's done on, use of herbicides to maintain the, the problem. The I completely understand. I just I want I want you. It would be a separate group of people that would yeah, no, we don't want to misspeak. But it's yeah. the same yeah. company. So, yeah. 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 so I just want to say, you know, I, I think that moving forward, I think the most transparent that everyone can be, and I think that one of the concerns that we have is, you know, with the uh, change that was submitted and no notice really given to us, and not giving us a chance to let the public know that these were happening, and you know, coming here as a sort of well, this is, you know, you have no choice. I think it's just coming back in two weeks and letting us know what things are moving forward, even if it isn't your department. I think it's an important thing that the public understand that this is part of the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that said, we have not got, I have not gotten any letters, particularly from many of you. Some, there's a handful, but you've been talking to them, they've been giving the information. Um, there hasn't been a lot of pushback where we be taking a more serious position at, at this point. But again, just as much transparency as you can, even if it, if it puts you or your higher ups in, in an uncomfortable position, just know that we're trying to work on this. And the key to, we found a key in Weston, you communicate with people and are honest and, and let them know what's going on, they generally understand and accept. Um, but
but if you don't, like, they're like, why are you doing it that way? And it raises suspicions, and it's just going to make it more complicated for us. And therefore, you know. One other, just a quick question I have. One other question um, from a resident is, um, they're concerned about um, if Eversource does use that DOT access um, between someone's lot and Route 57 at the very top of Upper Parish Drive, they're questioning whether they have to, uh, whether you also have to get permission from the resident that lives near there. Um, and um, and uh, also, they just talked about their you know, fear that there's going to be a lot of trees cut down in that area. So that's something that, again, it's, it, it's one thing to file an amendment. It's another thing to come and, you know, put up a over, something on the overhead projector and, you know, use your laser pointer to say this is the area we're coming in at and these are the trees we think we're going to get cut. It's that, you know, the opportunity to do that has passed and that's, that's the shame. what you said I have no I have no justification to do that the problem is and I think this is where we don't have an understanding a common understanding is now you're going back to them to tell them about what has been approved and I think that's difficult for some of those people um, because you know you're coming to them saying hey all right now we have the final plans and, and here's what's been approved by the siting council so they, they I think they feel that they have missed an opportunity if they disagree with the final plans now that they know what they are to go to the siting council and say hey we have issues because that's the, that's the point of appeal and it's kind of and I, so just give people the opportunity to appeal when they have it and and you guys have an asymmetric amount of information you guys know stuff that's happening that they don't so just do your best to level it out we're going to speed this up yeah Jonathan, we yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll see some people in a couple of weeks. And thank you for continuing to be trans. We do have to move this along. We have a board of finance meeting in the other room, and we have to join to do a couple of things. Just take one minute. Um, we have your permission to have this table, these two last things. And by the way, give you anything you said you've done, we're going to be Okay. Richard, can you see this? This is a piece of paper that says, I am requesting you to notify me in writing and I want you to come into my house, everything that's going to happen in the tax, my property, my properties do be uh, identified here with your LC number and everything else. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you guys. Um, thank you. Um, we're going to move through these other uh, items fairly quickly. I don't want to shortchange our prospective candidate. Uh, we've got an interview with prospective candidate 
uh, for the Western CT Convention and Visitors Bureau Board. Uh, in honesty, I had no idea we had one. <laughs> um, I found out when we had an opening, we had two candidates, one of them's dropped off. So basically, um, come on up, Debbie. <laughs> So thanks for coming up. Um, very impressive resume. Intimidating, actually. <laughs> um, hope I don't get on your bad side. <laughs> um, that said, it does look like you. It's incredible the amount of stuff you've done. So the only question I'm going to ask you is, um, what do you think you can do for less than that? Well, I was raised here. I, my family lived here from 78 to 90, and then I, I graduated, and my parents moved to Atlanta, and so since then I've traveled the country working in different big cities, small cities. Um, I think first, what my parents did in Weston when I was here taught me how to be a public servant, taught me how to make wherever I am the best that it can be. And throughout my career in politics, I've always done selfless work. I never want my name to be on anything. I do things for the good of the community that I'm either living and working in, or for example, when I worked at the U.S. Chamber, I traveled eight states working with some very small chambers that had a half, half staff person that had 50 members, anywhere to a state chamber that had thousands of members to work with them to find out what issues were they facing and how could I best help them. So I think using the political background that I have and from what I've seen living and working in different areas, working with Weston, and we're so glad to be back here. We moved back here in October, and this is the greatest place I've ever lived. I'm so thankful I'm back. Um, but I think using my advocacy background, working with other very small towns like us that are more residential than commercial, what are the problems we're facing? What are the challenges? and how have they either solved them in the past, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and then use the tourism board, use their resources to help promote us in a reasonable way that would be good for us. I don't think bringing a big conference to Weston would work, that's just not us. But using the local events, like the pollinator event, the shot farm, all the great parks we have, the Dallas Den, and the Segley Park, and I lived down the road from Eva Lagali on the bird sanctuary, and that wasn't here when I was here, but I do remember her and her desire to have a bird sanctuary. Um, I think promoting the natural aspects and the natural resources that Weston has would be a great way to showcase Weston in a positive light. And like I said, working with other small towns as a team to promote our areas would be a great way to bring in non-resident tax dollars to help us because they, they shop at the center or they buy tickets to a Le Shot event, or tickets to a library event, or you know, even driving through one city to another, stop at the center and have lunch at the lunchbox, or anything else that opens up there. Um, but I think my background, and I just, I love Weston. I think this is a great place to live and to be with my family, and I just want what's best for us. And then obviously, like I've heard, open communication is extremely critical when promoting a town making sure that everyone's investment in the town are protected and watched out for. I think would be a big part of this too. Bringing, either bringing things to town that would help us or making sure that things that just don't help the town go to a town that can help. Okay. Um, so I see that you, you, know, you work with other communities and other things and one of the opportunities I think, because I, I didn't know we had one of these boards either, um, but working with the marketing team who are developing collateral and developing different information to promote the town. So I think, you know, having your leadership skills and working and liaising with that group would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. That, a lot of my background is creating things to either get people to an event or building coalitions of people. So finding a commonality between groups is a strength that I have, whether it's a super small thing that, you know, people may come into a room and say, gee, we have nothing in common, and then after a couple conversations, you're like, oh my gosh, well, I graduated from Weston, and oh, well, I went to this college, and hey, I like the color blue, and it's amazing how you can find a common thing to, to blossom. Well, I, again, I'm completely impressed with how overqualified everybody who comes in and volunteers. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my, yeah. Luckily, don't. No, my dad was chairman of the Board of Ed when I graduated high school. And my mom was queen of every PTA or PTO for every school. So they knew gossip before I did growing up. And, you know, it was just great to watch them, how they thrived in this town. And I'm, I just hope to do as good as they do. We have so many things in our house now that were theirs that from Weston that I really cherish. They're, it makes it very special. Thank you. I mean, your, your resume, as uh, both my colleagues said, is absolutely spectacular. Your book was definitely, uh, so I think very lucky to have this attack. And when you're doing stuff, come back and tell us what it is they yeah, do. Well, <laughs> I have no idea what they're doing. Absolutely. Maybe a brochure. <laughs> this town is a shining star. It's just, I lobby my, my political advocacy about I lobby my husband to move here for years. He's been trying to And it finally worked. And now he's like, why did I say no for so long? Always listen to me because in our family, I'm usually right. So, it works for us. So, I'm good. Uh, can I have a motion? Yeah, I move to appoint Debbie Brothers to the Western Medical Convention and Visitor of the Year Award. Have a second. Second. Any discussion? Thanks for coming out. Thank you. All it's in favor? Honor. It's going to be such a pleasure. Aye. 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 Okay, uh, next item uh, discussion, decision. Uh, establishment of a public hearing concerning new transfer station fee schedule. So we set it in the budget. Uh, legally, according to the ordinance, we have to uh, have a public hearing to present to the public to get their feedback. Um, do we go over this now or do we go over this at the hearing? Well, is that if the public right now, just saying, I'm going to advertise this. So. Okay, okay, so. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. So we the, also done a little homework on this. Okay. So, um, got your current fees. Right now, if you come in to the, um, buy a ticket, uh, I'm sorry, if you go to the transfer station and you have um, household waste, not bulky waste like a couch or anything like that, you have household waste like your, tip, you know, the trash underneath your counter type of thing, and you have like tons of it and you put it in your truck and you'll get weighed in with your vehicle using the scale, it's a rate of five cents per pound. That's what you're charged. If you come in to buy a st sticker, it's $1.50 for a sticker, and you could apply that to a bag that is um, no larger than 30 gallons. If, and we've done some digging to find this, um, if, you are, if you qualify under the town um, tax relief for the elderly program, it's 75 cents and you purchase that from the tax office because she, tax collector's office, because she has that at a you know, few clicks of the, on the computer. And it's 50 cents per sticker if you qualify for the state program. And again, those can only be sold from the tax collector because she could look it up lickety split. Proposed fees goes, um, really they center on the 250 price. Um, so that equates, so if it's 250 per sticker, um, that means the five cent per pound goes to 8.3 cents per pound. Could we, I would propose we round that up or down. Um, I understand the, the mechanism, but. I, 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 I thought about that, but then I think, well, the weights are not even. <coughs> so it's always gonna be at some okay, change good point. level. Yeah. Okay, so leave it. And, um, and then corresponding, just keeping with the same ratio, <coughs> we have the other two sticker prices. There would be a dollar 25 for those qualifying under the town's tax relief program for the elderly and 83 cents for those qualifying under the state. <coughs> the state has a lower uh, income threshold. And we have to advertise this, how many days in advance? Um, it gets advertised, um, I think at least five days in advance. More work hour? But we're gonna do it, and yeah, so it'll, it'll be more than that. And, the, and this would be, um, and the motion to be held at your next board of selectmen meeting. And then it gets, then the change gets advertised in the paper. And once it gets advertised in the paper, it must be advertised for 30 days per the ordinance before it could take effect. So to be safe, I chose July 1 as a new start date. Okay. And this is in accordance with what has been approved uh, by the budget process. Who wants to read the paragraph? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. My husband will yell at me. <laughs> He's going to buy all his stickers now. Um, I move to establish a public hearing at 7.30 p.m on Thursday, May 23rd, 2019, in the town hall meeting room for purposes of inviting the public to express their opinion 
on the following proposed transfer station fee schedule to take effect July 1, 2019. 8.333 cents per pound for household so we waste weighed <laughs> at the transfer no, station and $2.50 per sticker for trash bags up to 30 gallons in size containing household waste with discounted pricing of $1.25 per sticker for residents qualifying under the Town of Weston's tax relief for the elderly program Fifty cents per sticker. Uh, Eighty-three. It should be eighty-three. I'm sorry. Eighty-three, 83 right. cents per sticker for residents qualifying under the State of Connecticut Elderly Homeowners Tax Program. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That will be an interesting meeting. Um, next, uh, we are. Uh, Discussion, dis discussion, decision concerning wage increases for non-union employees and medical insurance premium cost share for non-union employees. As you know, we're in the middle of negotiating four different bargaining units. Um, their raises, their uh, shares are codified in negotiation contracts and we usually uh, commensurately, you know, from the non-union staff, you don't want to benefit or uh, harm one set or the other, so we try and keep them in parallel, and just because they're not in a union doesn't mean that they shouldn't have representation. Um, so that said, what we try and do, and what Jonathan did, was put together um, a sheet that characterized the um, current medical insurance participation share uh, for all the units that we've already agreed to. You can see the current rate and the uh, shares in the future basically go up uh, usually 1% every year. Um, we don't have that for the non-union because we don't know. So Jonathan's proposal would be what we do is... Um, if you just, uh, actually just, it's a little different, but since we're, as Chris said, we're negotiating four contracts. Police is ratified, just waiting to get the formal signature. Dispatcher, I'm expecting the signatures any day. And they're all two, the, the, the actual raises, are 2.25 going up to 2.5 almost all the units more or less are now and, and we're still negotiating town hall and public works we have negotiation sessions next week so i think it is safe at this time to go ahead considering what's been given to the police department union and the public i'm oh, sorry and the dispatchers union to give the same to non-unions so that'd be a general wage increase of 2.25 percent retroactive to july 1 of 18 and 2.5 percent effective july 1 of 19. And then the health insurance, I recommend that you allow me to adjust the non-union uh, health insurance share um, to something um, similar, similar similar to the unions. I just have to figure that out because we're still in negotiation with the unions. So um, it would be similar. I don't know what it's going to be exactly. We're still negotiating. So if, if that's... Um, Okay with you, I think that's going to be fair. Um, I just don't, I'm, I'm, I want to hold off on that because I don't know what's going to happen with the non union. And I, I don't want to set something for the non union that's going to be higher than the Or affect the right union. Yeah. Or affect the union. So. Um, now, just for disclosure, I'm not a beneficiary of this. My salary is set differently. So I don't have to recuse myself. Um, <laughs> I'm just I think you do will get, actually I think it does impact you. You will pay more for health insurance. For health insurance. And, and, and I believe. But I don't, be, but I believe the salary we set separately. I think it does per the charter stay the same. I'm not sure of that. I thought there was a physical check. mechanism. You could, you could just recuse. I'm gonna recuse myself in anyway. Just in case. <laughs> and if, we'll double check on the charter. It may say something like, uh, Let's not dwell on and recuse him just because I might be a beneficiary. Yeah. In any event, I'm impacted by health insurance. So you two have at it. Can so I have a motion to vote for the general wage increase for non-union? This is going to be the last vote they did. And then we're going 5% retroactive to July 1st, 2018. And 5% retroactive to July 1st, 2018. And authorize the town administrator to set a medical insurance treatment cost share for non-union employees. Similar to so. Executive session. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, guys. I've got something more for you. It's good. Aye. 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 Um, okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to enter into a joint. Jonathan, I think we have to add to this uh, who's joining us. Do we know yep. who, who's um, here? Just board of, you can just say board of finance. The, the other people? Yeah, the Dave minutes Unger? will reflect. But, anybody, but no, anybody else? We've got to invite Dave um, Unger in. And we've got um, Mark Crowley. Yes, I'm Mark sorry. Crowley. Mark Crowley, Dave Did Unger. Keith here? No. I didn't see Keith. Sorry, right. I, I think that's just it. Mark, myself. Okay, so when someone makes the motion, please add those two in. Uh, I move to enter executive session with the Board of Finance, Dave Unger, Mark Crowley, and Jonathan. And Jonathan. <laughs> to, discuss possible to discuss possible per potential purchase of real estate. Okay, are we going there or are they coming here? We'll go there. Let's we'll go there. Second. Oh, shit. <laughs> Any discussion?